that it's Thursday, July 12th, 2018. And then I'm Layla Boral here with Steve. And Steve. 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 Ashkenazi um, in his home in Brooklyn for the or Stonewall Oral History Project. Thank you. And I'm glad to be here. Excellent. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. So I wanted to ask you if you could tell me where and when you were born and something about how you grew up. Okay. I'd love to point out the fact that I was born in the first half of the 20th century, even though it's just by six months. I was born in June of 1949 in Brooklyn, um, and it was a great time and a great place to be born. It was a very Jewish community. Um, television was brand new. Air conditioning was not far behind. We, you know, um, so it was just it was it was post-war, and uh, things were booming. I was, you know, part of the baby boomer generation, and it was it was a great time. I, I had a lovely family. My, I had two brothers and grew up in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, in 1949. And so my formative years were the 50s. I, I, you know, grew up and went to public school in the 1950s. And it should have been a great time. I wasn't a really happy kid because I knew I was different from the get-go. I wanted to play with dolls and did um, until they were taken away from me. And I very subversively figured out that people thought it was okay if I played with puppets. So I, and so I became a puppeteer and knew Paul Winchell and um, Edgar Bergman, uh, what it, who, Edgar Bergen, I guess, yes, who um, had Charlie McCarthy and also I became infatuated with puppets and I would put on puppet shows, but they were really dolls for me. And when other people were watching, I wasn't putting on shows, but I was I'm playing with my puppets. And so I, I figured out a subversive way to play with dolls as a little boy. Um, I didn't have a lot of friends. Both of my brothers were really popular, went out of the house all day and were playing ball and collecting baseball cards and stuff. And, I sat indoors and watched a lot of TV and played with my toys because um, I knew I was different. And um, it took a long time to figure out what the difference was. But that's probably a longer answer than you wanted to. No, not Next at all. Next question. <laughs> not at all. Can you um, tell me what kind of work did your dad do? and? What kind of, like, were you a working class kid, a middle class kid? My father was literally blue collar. He wore a blue work uniform to work every day, but he owned his own factory. My grandfather owned a factory, and my, and my, my father's parents had 13 children. And all of my father's brothers and brother-in-laws worked for my grandfather in some capacity in this factory. My father was very independent and really couldn't work for anybody, even family. And so he started his own company and opened a factory in East New York of his own. Um, but even at the point where my father had a hundred employees working for him um, and, and he was the boss, my father would go into work in work clothes like a mechanic and was never above picking up a broom and sweeping the floor if that was the most expedient way to get things done. And I like to think that it's one of the lessons he imparted to me is that there's no work that's degrading. Um, there's nothing that I would ever expect someone else to do for me that I should be embarrassed or annoyed to do for myself or for someone else. So my father gave me that really great work ethic that it's really good to keep busy. So that that was um, that was what my father did. What kind of factory did he have? The main item that he made and was, and was a niche that he created for himself back in those days and 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 prior to that, um, you could not buy milk in a store. Milk was delivered every day to your doorstep. My father came up. My father was an inventor too. He had many inventions and patents. My father came up with the idea of creating a milk box 
an insulated milk box so that milk wouldn't spoil. Um, and, and he went around and convinced uh, dairy companies that not only was it good for the um, customer, but they could put their logo, their name and the logo on their box, and therefore it would be free advertising, and it would make a loyal customer, because once you had seal test milk box on your stoop, you were unlikely to change to a different company. So my father created this product, sold it, and um, and although a couple of people copied him much later on, I would say that 90% of the milk boxes in the entire country were created at my father's factory. And I would work there after school and, and sometimes in, on weekends in, um, in the factory. So that, that was his main product, he, he created that. And do you remember how you thought he perceived you? <sighs> my parents loved me very much. They loved both the children, all three of the children. Um, my father worried about me. He worried that I wasn't masculine enough. He tried to get me interested in sports, tried to get me interested in fishing, hunting. I'm a vegetarian, and I know that my vegetarianism, and I've been a vegetarian since 1969, and I know that my vegetarianism is definitely influenced by the fact that I saw my father bring home deer strapped to the hood of his car. And even at 10 years old, I decided I'm not eating that. So, um, but, my, but my parents were patient. I, I got sent to child psychologists um, during a number of periods as a child. And I never knew exactly why. I guess it was because I was very shy, I was very introverted, um, did not have friends, um, always did adequate in school. It was, I was always, my report card always said not living up to potential. So I always somehow um, indicated in some ways to all of my teachers that I had the ability to do much better than I did, but always managed to be an average C student anyway, because my mind was always somewhere else. And how was your mom? My mother was a very involved parent. First of all, I have to tell you, my parents married very young. My father was 19 and my mother was 16. I, growing up, I was always told, that was because it was during the war and people did that. It was many years later that I discovered, no, other people didn't do that. That was really crazy. But they got their parents' permission and my mother was 16, my father was 19, and they had children right away. My mother is 90 now and, and I have a th an a older brother who's three years older than I am. So she was having children by the time she was, you know, 17. Um, but my mother really took to mothering. She was a great mother. She, as soon as we started going to school, she joined the PTA. She became the treasurer of the PTA. She became a den mother in Cub Scouts. Um, so, my, so she was constantly, constantly involved in what we were doing. And you've spoken about, and I've spoken to you about how much I enjoy having company in my home. Um, part of that is because that's what I saw my parents do. Our, our house was always the place where um, my brother's friends, and eventually when I did have friends, my friends would come to play. And relatives and friends of my parents, our house was always a place where people would come to together. And do you remember kind of actively trying to hide that you were different or how, like how, how did you kind of perceive yourself and what you were, should be doing? I, I lied. I, I, I'll tell you a couple of, couple of my earliest memories are, are lies. I remember one, I was in kindergarten and the teacher asked everybody to name their favorite color and went around the room and asked everybody what their favorite color was. And I thought, gee, my favorite color is red, but I can't say that, that's a girl's color. And so I said green, and I thought, ooh, green, but I thought that that will protect me. So, um, yeah, so 
I, I knew that I was very concerned with not appearing effeminate and, and, and that it would be perceived in a bad way. And so I protected myself in that way, but I knew that I was different. I can even remember, and it, it, I had to be maybe seven or eight years old at most, hearing about Christine Jorgensen, the first when it, it became news, and and um, as the first transgender, it was called transsexual that person, and. And that was reaffirming to me. That was like, you know, there's someone else like me um, who was born a man but doesn't want to be what men are supposed to be. And I thought for a long time that that's what I'm going to do when I grow up. I'll become a woman because that's, um, that's an option. But I never told anybody. And tell me about um, religion in your family. How observant was your family? My family was not observant. This is a whole other topic, but um, I grew up in what I like to describe as a non-practicing Orthodox family, which means that we didn't keep kosher at home, we didn't keep the Shabbat, um, we, didn't, we didn't pray every day, we, we didn't do anything at home in a normal life. But on those occasions when you needed a rabbi or needed to go to synagogue, either for a wedding or a bar mitzvah, um, or a, a, after birth, um, it had to be an Orthodox rabbi, and it had to be an Orthodox synagogue. And that's not, that, that's actually not that uncommon, but that's what it was. So we didn't do anything, but we, but when we did, it was Orthodox. Much later on, well, not even much later on, after I really came out, and especially when I got involved in the gay community, um, I became not only an atheist, but an, an ardent atheist. I totally, totally believed that religion was the opiate of the masses. That was, that was the slogan, and I, all through college, I believed that and said it, and, and after joining the gay movement. Um, I found religion very much on my own, and it was a struggle, and it's, it's off topic for probably where we're going today, but um, it was, you know, in my in my mid twenties, mid late twenties, I I was actually invited to the to be the guest speaker at the gay synagogue, Bet Simchat Torah. I was the guest speaker um, for the Friday night after services to talk about um, the work that I was doing to um, get the foster care system, the children's services more responsive and less discriminatory to LGBT youth. And, and just being in that environment was a moving experience for me. I actually wept, I, I, I lost control, I just, I had a very spiritual experience and that was just the beginning of, of, of a several year um, personal growth that I went through that brought me to religious observance which included a, a, a year spent in Israel. I read that. Studying in a yeshiva. Oh. Wow. I read that, mm -hmm. I, and I assumed that, that you had grown up in an observant, in a more observant No, I, I it, it was a real struggle for me, you know, and, and it's funny because a lot of the work that I do today is helping people who grow up in observant environments and observant families, and Jewish, Orthodox Jewish families, and struggle with their coming out. Mine was, I, I had a struggle with being this gay activist, struggling with um, accepting my religious uh, identity and, 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 and affirming it, and which just went against everything that I was doing and was taught and, and, and was very counter to everyone that I was associating with, all of my friends. I mean, you know, it, was, it was very strange <clears throat> in the late 70s. Um, becoming religious in as as a very involved gay activist. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I liked in, in Trumbull um, Before God, I thought yeah. there's, the rabbi says something like, 
if sinners weren't allowed in, we couldn't, we wouldn't right. have a minion right. or something like that. Yeah, I that's just, true. I love that. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a whole topic in itself of the yeah. work that I'm, that, but that's work that I'm doing now. And <clears throat> I always tell people, and this is important because it's, it's really about how change happens. Like some people, always, you know, some people live so much in the moment, moment and especially when I talk to millennials, sorry, millennials, um, who don't realize how far we've come in terms of the acceptance of the LGBT people and think that some things are never going to change. And I've seen so much change in my life that I know that it's very real. So I like to remind people that in the Orthodox community or in any religious community, change is happening slower, but it's already happening. It's already happening. And um, if people say, well, my rabbi is never going to accept this, and I say, yes, but in 15 years from now, you won't be talking to your rabbi. You'll be talking to his children. And they have grew up in a different world than he did. So change is happening. So tell me about, um, I, I read that you, I, I think you said you came, you knew, you actually could name what was different about you at yeah. maybe 12 and actually came out at 14. Can you tell I me I probably about knew, that? okay. Um, I, I came out really young. And although I, I deal with people all the time who come out very late in life, I don't really understand. I'm really supportive of people. But I really don't understand how you could not know something as basic as who you're attracted to. So I... I, I had inklings even at 10 years old, but by 12 years old, it was just where I knew that I was gay. I knew that I, I, I knew that I was attracted to men. I knew that um, I was never going to be attracted to women sexually. And um, at 12 years old, I started fooling around with a few friends, but it was just adolescent fooling around. In fact, oh, about about 20 years ago, I did have an opportunity to have a conversation with one of the boys that I used to fool around with and was bold enough to bring it up. He had no recollection of it. And he was the initiator. In fact, he was the one that taught me that, hey, you can do this. You can, you know, and, and, and not be considered gay, but you can just, hey, let's jerk off together or let's play strip polka just for the fun of it. Um, so he was the one that first taught me that, and, and so that was something that with a small circle of people I did for a while, and he had no recollection of it. Um, and I knew that this was a stopgap solution. I knew that's not what I really wanted. I wanted to make love to a man. First of all, I wasn't attracted to people my own age. I was always attracted to older guys, although now I am older, so older can mean a little bit younger than me. Um, and I'll tell you a funny story I like to tell people now. Because when I did come out at 14, I was dating older men. And in, in a few cases, I know that in my mid, early and mid-teens, I was with men who were over 70. So I like to point out to people that I have had sex with men who were born in the 1800s. So, if, if nothing else, that certainly makes me uh, a living relic to history. <laughs> um, yes, I, I have had sex with men who were born in the 1800s, so that's a little bit of history that I carry with me. But so, I knew at 12 years old that I wanted, I, I was, my libido was very high. I really wanted to have sex. I knew what it was. I read Playboy magazine, and that's, that's a whole important thing. Playboy magazine was a very important mentor to me. It taught me that sex was not dirty. Um, I know that people are down on it now because of it, it's objectifying of women, but I can remember, I mean, women were the object because it was a, it was a magazine for men, but unlike other porno magazines, um, women were never, I mean, they were the object of sexuality, but it was clear that they enjoyed it. It was clear that they had a choice. You never saw women bound or wearing 
um, degrading outfits. Um, women were, were part of this party, and it was about liberating everybody's right to their body and sexuality. And so I, I discovered a place that at 12 years old I could buy Playboy magazine that wouldn't, as long as I bought a couple of comic books at the same time. Um, and I read them cover to cover. When people say that they, you know, it was always a joke that they only buy for the articles, I read every article and read them over and over because that to me was the only place I was getting the message that sex is not dirty. Um, and even though homosexuality was rarely mentioned, it was mentioned, it was there. And, you know, we were part of that world. And it was a very important message to me that I, I got from Playboy magazine that I was okay and I didn't, um, that I didn't have to be ashamed and that I wasn't sick. So, um, but I still wanted to meet somebody for real, but I had no idea how to do that. And then when I was 14 years old, it was early in the morning, before going to school, I was reading the newspaper. I think I, I, we had an assignment for our social studies class that we had to find an, an current events article in the newspaper and bring it in and talk about it. Well, this isn't the article that I brought in, but there was an article in, I don't know if it was the New York Times or I think it might have been the Herald Tribune, which was still around then. And the story was about the fact that the mayor of the city, um, John Lindsay, well, the World's Fair was still in New York. The World's Fair was in New York in 1962, 63. And it was supposed to only be a one-year thing. But the mayor decided he was going to keep it for next year. They had to change the name. They couldn't call it World's Fair because that's an international brand. Um, but they kept most of the pavilions and most of the right. And, um, because it was such a boon to tourism and it was very good financially for the city. So the mayor announced that we were going to keep the, the World's Fair up for an extra year to bring in tourists. And as part of his bid to bring in tourists, the article said that um, he was beating a project to clean up Times Square. And the article said that because Times Square is full of drug addicts and prostitutes and homosexuals. It was the first time I ever saw that word in print. I knew what it meant and it was like, that's where the homosexuals are. I have to get to Times Square and I have to get there quick before they clean them up. So that was the closest I ever came to cutting school. I was, I was not a good student, but I was a good student in terms of I've never cut class. I always did whatever I was supposed to do. But I know I sat through class that whole day just looking at my watch and worrying that by the time I get to Times Square, all the homosexuals are going to be gone, the city's going to clean them up, and I'll be too late. Um, but after school, I knew I had to get to Times Square. I had never been on the subway by myself, but I knew where the subway was. I had to take a bus to get to the subway from where I lived in East Flatbush. And I had to ask the, the, the token person the, um, how to get to Times Square. And I was very worried, but I was, so I was riding the train to Times Square. And it wasn't until I got to 34th Street that it occurred to me that I have no idea what to do when I get to Times Square. Um, but it didn't matter. Somebody approached me before I even got out of the subway. And I had my first adult sexual experience with a man that I went home with. And, and Times Square became a major hangout for me. I spent a lot of time going to Times Square. And because I was meeting men, I discovered other places. I discovered Christopher Street and I discovered bars. And even though um, sometimes I get carded until I was too young, more most of the time, I, I didn't get stopped and I started going to bars. And so I, I became extremely sexually active at 14. And were you um, 
at that point sort of comfortable with who you were and how much were you hiding? So well, I was I was hiding. I, I was living a dual life. No, nobody knew where I was going. Um, it amazes me sometimes today what an expert liar and alibi maker I was, especially because I've, I've spent more recent years in dealing with LGBT youth and. Uh, and it's just amazing how kids get caught and how stupid they are. You know, you can't stay out all night without calling your parents and giving them some excuse. Um, I was wonderful at calling my mother and say, "Oh, I'm studying at Bobby's house, and for the test tomorrow." And his mother asked if I could stay for dinner, but I said, "I have to call you. Is it okay if I stay for dinner?" So I was always calling in, always, you know. We... Oops. Mm -hmm. Speaking okay. of calling. <laughs> that was kind of That's perfect. What, right. Michael picked it up. Okay. So. Okay. So I always checked in. I always go. I always had an album. We always had a rehearsal at school for a school play or something. Um, I was going to the library. I, you know, my mother always thought I was within a few blocks of the house, and I was in Manhattan. You know, in a bar or at the baths or in some man's apartment. Um, and I was having a wonderful time. I loved it. I didn't feel guilty about what I was doing, and maybe that's because of, as I said, about um, the mentoring that I got from Playboy magazine. But I, I did worry. I, I wasn't happy being gay. I didn't feel there was anything, I didn't feel that it was a sickness. I didn't feel that it was a sin. But I did feel that it could not lead to a happy life. I, many of the men that I was with, I weren't great role models. I, so I still knew that I'm having a lot of fun, this is great, but I will um, eventually get married and have children and put this behind me. Um, and, and did go through therapy um, with that goal in mind. But it wasn't about guilt. It was just about not not seeing this as a viable option for a happy life. Because I had no role models um, as people do today. So, and did your parents, when did your parents figure out not so much what you were doing but that you were gay? I told my parents. Um, and this at the firehouse and GAA, uh, where I became very, very involved, and, and uh, we'll talk about that. So I had a crush on a guy at the firehouse. He was fifty. He was in his fifties, and um, I don't know what his exact title was at the firehouse. His name was Guy Charles. His name was Guy Charles, and he was part of. Um, the public relations arm of, and he would write press releases every single week, and every single day he'd write press releases, and because I had a car, and that was a, a big part of why I got to do many of the things that I got to do, I actually had a car. I was, I was only 21, 22 years old. Um, and so, around midnight every night, we would take these press releases, and we, and I drive Guy Charles around the city to the Post, the News, the New York Times, and we drive. Them. I don't remember if any of them ever got published, but we would leave press releases about work that was being done at GAA at all the newspapers every night and night. So. At, at, at the night desk, and I and I would drive Guy Charles around, but I had this crush on Guy Charles, and Guy Charles says I cannot date someone who's not even out to his parents. So I had to come out to my parents. So, um, so this was a huge favor the guy did for me, um, because I don't know when or how I would have done it otherwise. But I was motivated by my desire 
to have this relationship with Guy and Charles, who I had this major crush on. And so, um, because he insisted on it, so this is 1970, maybe it was early 71, it was late 70, early 71, I came out to my parents. So I'm so glad I did, but it did not go well. Um, but they didn't kick me out of the house, and I never thought that that was an option. There was lots of screaming, um, and in fact, I. Okay. Can we turn the ringer off? Or, oh, or it's maybe probably, not really. Um, if I knew how to do that, I would. But I could just put this somewhere. We where, can put it somewhere else, and maybe one of our colleagues can sort of turn yeah. the ringer off. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Just, just to kind of something. That was a good idea. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sorry. So, I, after I came back to my parents, it, it did not go well. And I, I have to say that for the next two years at least, we did not have a civil conversation. I mean, every conversation ended in screaming. And, um, and at their insistence, I did agree to go back into therapy, um, which turned out to be a really good thing. So everything worked out for the best, you know. I, 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 because uh, after you know, even after I came out to my parents and I tried to have a relationship with Guy Charles, it, it lasted for like a week, and we realized we were just completely incompatible. Um, so, but he did me this great favor of pushing forward my coming out to my parents. So. Um, Came out to my parents, we, we screamed and yelled, and for the next two years did not have a civil conversation that didn't end in screaming and yelling. But I got back into therapy, which was very helpful for a variety of other reasons. It didn't make me straight, uh, which was their goal, not mine. And, um, but eventually, like in most coming out, they just got used to it. They just got used to it. and. Um, and they saw that I was still the same person. And um, so it just became a non-issue. And, and eventually they became very proud of the work that I was doing. So it, it, it was a good thing. But um, that's how I came out to my parents. Although it was insane. First I came out to my mother. And, and this is part of the... Um, the way that comings out often take place. My mother took it very badly, but she insisted, don't tell your father. This, he'll, he'll never accept it. I'm trying to be, uh, she, she wanted to take her private money to pay for my therapy, but don't tell your father, don't tell your brothers. And for a while I complied with that. After my mother finally realized that she wasn't gonna change me, that it wasn't going to change. Then she decided to bring my father in, it. and uh, so it happened. And then they said, "Don't tell your brothers," but eventually they told on me. So um, <coughs> family dynamics are like that. People like to have secrets. <coughs> when you have a secret, um, it's called triangulation. You know, it's it's us against that other person. We have the secret, and they don't. So um, I'm keeping you in my corner. So. It's so much easier to be out and put all that behind you. And um, now everybody knows that I'm gay. Although I, I frequently remind people that coming out is, is something that you do all your life because you're always meeting new people. You're always in new situations. You're always someplace where you have to decide, do I announce this the minute I walk in the door? Or do I wait until the subject comes up? Or um, do I not mention it? Is it not relevant to what's going on? Or what happens if you really strike up a relationship with people and and then you come out later and it's like, you know, you, you lied to them? You didn't There's always some decisions to make about when is the appropriate right time to come out. You could, you could wear a t-shirt that says it. Um, and sometimes that's appropriate and sometimes it's obnoxious. So, you know, coming out is 
coming out is something you never completely put behind you. You, you know, even for someone who's as openly gay and has lived had a whole career as being an activist and, and being out, I still find myself in places where someone is meeting me for the first time and doesn't know that I'm gay. And um, I have to decide when it's the right time to tell them and when it's too soon and when it's too late. So let me ask you, in the late 60s... In this way. This way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Yep. I thought it was supposed to be over there. <laughs> Sorry. <Yep. laughs> yes, trying to direct my uh, okay. gaze. Yes, yes, yes. yes. To be okay. my gaze. <laughs> so, um, in 1969, when Stonewall happened, I think you were a student at Brooklyn College? I was. I, okay. In 1969, when Stonewall happened, it was the last week of June. I was already in Summerstock. I was telling some of you crew before that my very first career was in theater. I was a stage designer. Try to be an actor, but I decided I didn't have the talent, and so. But I became. I was doing scenery and costumes. Um, 1969. Um, I was at the Lake George Opera Festival. I was actually um, hired. I was the assistant to the director of public relations at the Lake George Opera Festival who happened to be a teacher of mine at Brooklyn College, who I also happened to be having an affair with. So we were living together, and he was my professor at Brooklyn College, and we were at Lake George. And so the news came out about Stonewall, and um, we were like amazed. This was, um, it was the second bit of news that week, because just a few days earlier, Judy Garland died. That was equally, maybe more at the time, even more momentous for um, people in the gay community, Judy Garland dying. Um, and so now we were, you know, hearing and reading the news about riots in Sheridan Square um, because of the raid on the Stonewall Bar, which was a, one of the bars that I used to go to a lot. It was one of the ones that least Asked me for ID. So I was not in town and could not run to Sheridan Square to be part of that. Um, and then it, uh, then it wasn't in the news anymore. And so although Stonewall sparked a movement, you know, once the, the, the rioting in Sheridan Square died down, it, it went very underground and I didn't hear anything about it. I didn't know that there were organizations that formed up about it. It wasn't until October of 1970, which is just a little bit more than a year later, I was working on a show at the Provincetown Playhouse on McDougal Street, which was just a couple blocks away from the firehouse. And a good friend of mine, a lesbian named Stephanie Ages, who I go back to junior high with, we were we would kind of snicker and make jokes um, and try to figure out who on the faculty was gay all the way back in junior high. And she told me about um, the Gay Activist Alliance on the Firehouse, but mostly about the fact that they, they used to have these dances on Saturday night. Um, and that was a great, which was one of the main fundraising efforts. So Stephanie said, "You have to go there. It's great. It's fun. it's a really incredible place. Big crowds and dancing." And so I went to the firehouse on a Saturday night to check out the dance. Um, and I'm, I've always been a bar person, and, and it was fun. But I'm not really never really into the mindless dancing and all. So I started to wander around the firehouse, which was all open, and discovered that in, in, the, in the basement level was the dancing and the, and the beer. Um, on the second level, um, there were social groups sitting around, and it was kind of like a big frat house or a clubhouse where it was just really ratty old furniture, but there was sofas and club chairs and 
tables where people would sit in groups, but I didn't know anybody there, so there was really no one to sit with. So I went up to the third floor, and on the third floor at the White House on Saturday nights, they had, and this will interest you, they had videos going. They'd play videos from their demonstrations and, and interviews, and they just had them going for people to come in. And, and, and I sat down, and I started to listen to people talk about being gay, so scenes from demonstrations where people were raising the fist and yelling gay power. I'd never seen images like that. And I realized that, you know, I wasn't interested in the dancing, but there's something going on in this organization that I want to be part of. And so I don't, I don't remember what my next step was, you know, but I talked to some people and found out that there were meetings to come to. And I started coming to meetings and and, and I got hooked, and my whole life has been, I said, you know, people ask me what you do, I say, I, I go to meetings, you know. All the organizations that I'm involved in, whether it's Stumble Democratic Club or Angel Learning, uh, basically I'm involved in going to meetings. I, I'd spent 30 years on Community Board 2 in Manhattan. I'm a meeting addict. I love going to meetings. I think things get accomplished. Um, you get to speak your point of view, and you get to learn things. You, you get to listen to other people's point of view. So I came back the next, I think, I'm not sure, but I think that GAA met on Thursday nights. I don't know why that suddenly comes up to me, but it must be true because it just seems so right. And, um, and I came back and, and it wasn't the dance scene. This was chair set up. I still have some of the original chairs from the firehouse. Um, where are they? Um, they're down the block in, a, in another cellar. I have six chairs from the firehouse days. Um, I'll tell you later why I have them, but um, I, they were borrowed at the, before the, it burned down. So, um, so I started going to these meetings, and I became very involved. And, um, and as I mentioned to you before, if you if you show up. And especially if you get there early, people will ask you to do something. And the fact that I had a car made a big difference. So within a very short time of joining GAA, I found myself chairing two different committees. One of them was the Leaflets and Graphics Committee. The original chair of that committee, his name was Tom Dewar, who I only remember meeting once who was one of those people that got involved in the LGBT movement early on and dropped out early on but left a major impact. It was Tom Dewar who decided that the Lambda should be the symbol of gay liberation. Um, and as, as chair of the Leaflets and Graphics Committee, he made that the image that became, again, his name was Tom Dewar, he was the one that made that decision. But he dropped out, and they needed a chair for the committee. And the fact that I had a car was extremely important because the Leaflets and Graphics Committee, when I, when I talked earlier about um, these press releases that, Char that Guy Charles would write every night, uh, we had a mimeograph machine. Does anybody still today remember what a mimeograph machine was? But that's how we copied things. It was very cumbersome. You had to type things onto a stencil and crank them out, um, and the ink would go through the stencil. So somebody had to be in charge of that. But also, the, we had an old, our mimeograph machine was a Gestetna. That was the brand name. I don't remember the model number, but the brand was Gestetna. It would break down frequently. And because I had a car, I could bring it into. It was too heavy to take on the subway or something. But um, every couple of months, it needed servicing. And I, because I had a car, um, I could bring it up to Chelsea, which was still highly industrial, um, to this um, repair place. There was. I remember there was. An old Jewish man who owned it, who always had a cigar in his mouth. His name was Max. 
And he always asked me about, so where's Tom Dewar? How's Tom Dewar? And I could tell that he had a great, and Tom was really, Tom was very Nordic, beautiful, blonde man. Um, and I could tell that it was a really disappointment to this old Jewish guy, Max, that I was the new person in charge and it wasn't Tom Dewar. So, uh, so what did you look like in those days? How did you dress? How did you present yourself in the world? I had a ponytail, um, which I liked, but I don't think it, when I look back at pictures, it, I don't think it was very becoming. <laughs> I think I, um, I have pictures from after I took it off that I think I looked better. I was, I was cute. I was young. I um, certainly had no problem meeting people. I was, you know, Instead of always going to bars and bathhouses, never had trouble meeting people that I wanted. Of course, I liked older guys, so I was younger, so I was very in demand. I'll tell you another story. It's unrelated, but it's really important as long as we're talking about how I looked. And so another way that people met, or for anonymous sex in those days, um, was tea rooms, subway bathrooms. A lot of people don't know about that. In fact, there's a there's a pretty good documentary film called Gay Sex of the 70s. Are you familiar with it? I'm not. Okay, Gay Sex of the 70s is a documentary film. It's maybe 10 years old. Um, and it talks about the backroom bars scene. It talks about the baths. It talks about the piers. It talks about the trucks, which are all different scenes in which gay men would meet and have sex. It totally leaves out and I, I spoke to the producers once and said, why? And they said, oh, that's right, we forgot. So most people today don't even realize that every single subway station in the entire subway system had a bath, had a men's room and a women's bathroom. And if the station was the kind of station where you couldn't get from the uptown to the downtown side without going out, then it had one on each platform. In Manhattan, and to some extent in Brooklyn, but in Manhattan, I would say that 90% of the men's rooms and subway stations had sex going on in them most of the time. And it was, um, it was just a, a cultural phenomenon that gay men knew about. And um, to, the, to the extent that if you were, when you were going on to the subway, and the train was just coming in, you didn't run to catch it. Because you would say, if you just missed the train, you say, well, I have five minutes, let me see what's going on in the bathroom. And people would um, go in the bathroom. And, uh, and when you would walk into the men's room of a bath, of a subway bathroom in those days, it wouldn't be empty, there'd be one or two or more guys sort of just lingering, like um, loitering, I should say, um, for no purpose. And, and then sizing up when you went in to decide whether or not you were just there accidentally to actually go pee, or whether you were gay and looking for something. And, and through eye contact, it was clearly, you know, quickly established whether or not you were a member or not, and people would have sex on them. The reason that I bring this up, well, for a lot of but so one time I was in one of those stations, and there was actually quite a few men in there, and people were having sex, and there were two younger men having sex, and there was a very old man there. I say very old. He was probably in the 60s, could have been more, but he was, he was an old man in the 60s. And he kept inching closer to the guys who were having sex and then would start to, to try to get involved and put his hand on them. And one of the guys kept pushing him away and pushing him away. And um, the third or fourth time that he did that, um, one of the young men punched him, knocked him down and start screaming at him. And I just, I was just so upset, and I start yelling at both of them. But, but, but mostly at the young man, I said, that's not a way to treat somebody. And you know, just, 
And, but I also told you, the old guy said, you know, if someone says no, it means no. But I, 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 I was just so upset, I just, I just was yelling at both of them. I said, you cannot do that. That's just not acceptable. But I kind of made, it, it left such an impression on me that I made a decision, and I know this sounds totally dumb and ridiculous, but it's something that I lived by for many, many years. I made a decision that whenever I was in a situation, like in a tea room, that's what we call subway bathrooms, they're called tea rooms, everybody knew. A tea room was a gay slang for a subway bathroom. Or a bathhouse, or the piers, or some pl or a back room bar, some place where I was going and expecting that I was going to ha have a multiple partners, you know, many partners over over the course of a couple of hours or something. I made a decision that I would have sex with at least one person that nobody else wanted, and I gave it a name. I called it community service. So it's my community service. As long as I was going to have sex with a lot of people, I'd have sex with with at least one person that clearly like was not going to get it if, if I wasn't there and that nobody else wanted. And I did that for many, many years. Um, and as silly as this sounds, I, I sometimes attribute maybe the karma or whatever that maybe it was, it was that that has preserved me that I, I think I look okay for my age. I know that um, I know some people still find me attractive and flirt with me. Um, I'm, I'm healthy and survived the AIDS crisis, which is, uh, you know, statistically an impossibility. Um, but I'm convinced that my community service had something to do with that. So what turned you into an activist? What was it about the GAA? Because I'm interested, it sounds like you didn't know about the march in 1970, or... Uh, no, uh, I, I did not know about the march in 1970. As I said, everything kind of went underground. The, the newspapers did not cover um, what was happening in the game. And that, and that was one of the, um, in the early days of, after I did get involved, much of our activism was um, targeted at the press for not covering what we were doing. Um, it was just, uh, it, you know, the New York Times and the Daily News, they just thought it was unseemly. And, you know, nobody wants to read about these, you know, um, gay people, or what they still called homosexuals. You know, it, it took a long time before they would use the word gay. But at that very first time in the firehouse, when I saw this um, video, I knew that this was... This was a cause I wanted. To, I wanted to be part of this community, and and I very quickly I, I talked about the leaflets and graphics committee. So, and so from riding around the city, distributing these press releases for Guy Charles, in which I was churning out on the mimeograph machine. But the other thing that happened because I was chair of the leaflets and graphics. So, in the beginning, the rule was that. Other members of GAA or committee chairs or officers, when they had a leaflet or or any announcement or a flyer that needed to be copied, mimeographed, they would have to give me the stencil already made up. They would have to type and press in any graphic or any onto the stencil. I would run it off. The rule was that I was the only person who was allowed to use the mimeograph machine because the more people that used it, the more it would break down. It was, it was very temperamental, and if you didn't do something exactly right, it was going to break down. So I was the only person, and in addition to having a car, I was also a good candidate for that job because I was there every day. I was at the fires every single day. I still have my keys to the firehouse. I so what, what was it that spoke to you? Like What, what was that feeling for you that you wanted uh, it to do was, that? Honesty, it was, it was the opportunity to be what I was told I couldn't be, to be open about it. Um, it's, it's an excellent question. What spoke to me? Um, it did. 
In a way that even overshadowed the, the, the very first thing that spoke to me in my life was the theater. You know, um, I tried so hard as, a, as an adolescent to find hobbies. My brothers always had hobbies, whether it was baseball, whether it was citizen man radios, whether it was coin collecting. And I would, I would try to follow in my brother's footsteps and pick up whatever they were doing. I would try to make that in my house, but I just had no interest. It wasn't until I found the Drama Guild at, at my high school that I found something that actually spoke to me, that I, had, that I was passionate about, that I wasn't just doing it for the sake of doing it because other people did it and said this is something you should, could do to, to use up your time. I fell in love with the theater. Um, and made that my first career, and that was what I was going to do. But something at the firehouse and in the gay movement spoke to me in a way that even overrid that and became a new direction for me. And how long did you stay um, so involved? At the firehouse? I've yeah. never not been involved. I mean, ever. Let me, let me finish talking about some of the things that I did do at the firehouse. Because okay. <clears throat> they're funny. There were little roles, but they became... So, in the beginning, it was necessary that people would have to give me the stencil, and I would run it off, because I was the only one that was allowed to use the machine. But eventually, um, people would either get lazy or, or take advantage of me and say, um, um, I didn't type it yet on the central. Here's Here's... Here's what I want to say. Could you type it out for me? And so I'd be typing onto the stencil, and then I started to just embellish them with little doodles and graphics. So I would like make up graphics. Um, but then I reached to a next step where people just give me notes and said, "Could you write a leaflet based on these notes?" And so I was writing. I was in my early twenties, but I was you know writing copy, and, you know, not copy, but I was. I was, you know, writing leaflets of flyers, and, um, and so that's how my job expanded. So that was, that was my experience on the leaflets and graphics committee. The other committee that I chaired was the goods and services committee. Now in the beginning, again, that needed to be done by someone who was there frequently, because the goods and services committee was basically, we had Lambda t-shirts and Lambda buttons, and I was the one who had the key to the supply cabinet, and if people wanted to buy one, I needed to be there to um, get them out and take money from them. So in the beginning, that was basically what goods and services were. I don't think we had anything that I would call services in the beginning, but I think that the name came from probably, you know, Socialist Workers Party, a lot of the early people who set up the firehouse, a lot of our committees, like the Agit Prop Committee, they were all taken from the names of very far left organizations. So goods and services was the name of a committee. And then, this is a whole story, but someone came to the firehouse one day with an idea. His name is Mel Rosen. He became very important in the gay community for later on for a lot of reasons. Uh, he died of AIDS at least 20 years ago or more. Uh, but Mel, Mel Rosen was, the work that he was doing then, he, he had a higher position in an employment agency. I don't know if there are employment agencies anymore. Everything's probably done, on, but there used to be employment agencies. And, and that's what, if he wanted a job, he went to an employment agency. And he came to the firehouse to tell us about a very terrible practice that went on in employment agencies. He said that if, um, if the interviewer or staff person in the employment agency suspected that you were gay, they would mark that on your application. They would not send you out to on job assignments because um, it would be a black mark on them as a as an employment agency to the prospective employer if they sent someone who turned out to be gay. So if you were gay or thought to be gay, um, it went in your file and you did not get jobs. So he came to GAA 
to talk to the executive committee and other people and said that there needs to be something to counter this. You know, we, you need to set up, we need to set up a gay employment agency um, to make up for this problem. So it, so everybody said, well, you know, it's a very good idea, but I don't know. So everybody said, so they said, well, I guess that fits in goods and services. And they sent him to talk to me. And I was young and didn't know that you could say no. I still don't know that. I still have trouble saying no. So um, he came and he was referred by the office of GA. And I just thought, this is like my duty. I have to have to work with him and set up um, a service. So once a week, um, and this was really my introduction to being a social worker. This is like my first. And it was just, and it was, it was even before I applied to social work school. So Mel Rosen <coughs> and I set up an employ, uh, it was called uh, the Gay Employment Project. Is that it? Gay Employment Project, yeah. And we would advertise on the back page of the Village Voice. The Village Voice in those days, the back page was like a bulletin board. And you could just take out like a two or three sentence ad for not very much money. And I got permission from GA to use to take that from Petty Cash every week. And we would just announce that on a um, certain night of the week, on the third floor, we would have this employment clinic. And we made up application forms. Which I still have somewhere. And that's so. That's because of my worry about confidentiality. When the fire has burned down, all of those filled out forms or some of that I took out of there are, are still in my mother's attic. I need to take a sip for a moment. Yeah. Thank you. So it became so popular that eventually we um, expanded to twice a week. At the firehouse, we had an employment clinic where um, people would come, and we get in 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 the heyday maybe ten to fifteen people uh, a night would come, and it wasn't and well, I learned the skills partly from Mel and partly just from intuition and being a ther becoming a therapist to interview people to figure out what they're looking for, what they want. And one of the things that Mel brought, and he also brought another person in, who we had a third person working for us for a while, who also worked for an employment agency, is, um, it was a bit of reverse discrimination. They knew where the jobs were. They were, they were um, using information, you know, insider information from their agencies to know who was hiring and we would send people um, on these jobs, doing what they were hiring. But we also, this is something I learned from Mel, and he would teach people. He would say, tell them what to say in an interview. And it, was, it was a great thing. He said, you know, if, if people ask you, where do you see yourself in five years from now? No, you don't say, I'm thinking about going back to school. You say, I want to be a vice president in this company. I mean, there were set answers that, you know, we would tell people how to get through an interview. Um, but it was also important, uh, you know, I learned the skills doing that, of figuring out what people want to do. That if someone is looking for something, needs money right now because they do want to do something else very soon, um, there are certain jobs that might be better for them. Whereas if someone is looking for an entry-level position, at something that's going to can really be a career for them as something else. So I became a job counselor at the Gay Activist Alliance in the firehouse um, because I didn't know that you could say no. And, um, and we set up this clinic and we ran it for at least three years. In fact, when the firehouse burned down and um, for a while the firehouse moved to a bathhouse, but it was not it was just too inaccessible for what we were doing. 
And so we moved it to the Manashin Society. The Manashin Society, which is another gay organization I'm sure you're familiar with. And for at least another year, um, we continued running the service at Manashin. So that was like, this is all early, early 70s stuff that I was doing. So that became a big um, part of my resume when I applied to social work school. And let me talk about that a bit, because that, that's really important. Um, once I realized that this gay activist stuff is really taking up all my time, I, I don't have time to pursue my career in theater anymore. Maybe I need to rethink that. I don't know if I could do both. And I started to figure out what can I do in professionally that fits into what I'm doing. And I talked to a number of people and was convinced that I should get my MSW, my Master of Social Work degree, and be a social worker. And, and that tied in very much with what I was doing. <clears throat> so I applied to social work schools. But because it was very important to me that I, I wanted to be a, a gay social worker, that I needed to be out, and that I didn't want to be stuck in a field placement that had nothing to do with what I was doing. I wanted to do a field placement in a gay setting. This is 1973 that I applied to schools. So the schools I applied to were Hunter, NYU, and Columbia. I got interviews at all three of them because I, I had really good resumes and because of political connections through someone at, at GAA, Ethan Ghetto. I actually got a, a personal reference from the New York Attorney General. So I was like, I had a really fantastic resume and a re application, but it also said that, you know, I was a gay activist who wanted to work in the gay community. So I, I did get interviews at all three schools. And all three schools said they would accept me but if I would agree to be in the closet. I remember specifically at Columbia, because I spoke to the associate dean at Columbia School of Social Work, and I remember this vividly. He said that being out in class would be, what was it, I'm sorry, being out in class would be disruptive, and being gay, openly gay, in my field placement would be unprofessional. So I was stuck with this dilemma <clears throat> that I, in order to get my master's degree, I had to go back in the closet. And then I received a phone call out of the blue. And someone says, is Steve Ashkenazi? Yes, yes, yes. Said he was given my name by a mutual friend, Bernice Goodman, who's an, another important early pioneer, who's a mentor on whose shoulders I stand. And um, he was the dean at Stony Brook. School of Social Work. He asked me if I ever heard of it. Never heard of it. He said he understands that I'm looking to um, apply to social work school, that I want to do it as an openly gay man, and I want to do my, my field placement in a gay setting. And I said yes. And he said they would be re really happy to sponsor me on this, would I consider going there? I didn't really have a choice. Um, I had no idea where, where, where Stony Brook was. I didn't realize it was going to mean a two-hour commute in each direction. But um, I went to Stony Brook. And it was, again, in the reverse discrimination kind of thing. After being turned down for what I wanted to do, I got recruited by Stony Brook, and they bent over backwards to, to help me and to make my experience easy. And it was, in some ways, it was too easy. Uh, it, for instance, we never had to write in a paper. I would just write it off the top of my head and say, there are no resources. I can't, you know, I don't have, so, you know, I'm just writing from my experience and what I know and what people tell me said, there are no books on this, there are no sources, so. And I would get A's. Everybody, everybody thought it was, what I was writing was relevant to, revel, 
revelatory and, and inspiring and um, and but I, I didn't have to do any reason. I just my first year field placement I did at the Institute for Human Identity. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It was an early um, community run LGBT run uh, mental health <coughs> clinic. And it was um, it was a wonderful experience. I met great people there, but it was very tame. It was very tame. The people coming in, you know, calling and and wanting to speak to a therapist. And we had very very low prices, uh, depending on ability to pay. And saw some people who didn't pay at all, uh, but basically saw people coming in and talking. Um, my next year field placement. The school suggested something. They set it up. They actually, they even got me a summer internship in a in a crisis center in the Bronx. That was amazing. But but my but my second year of real placement was a a brand new situation. Um, there was a it was a residential. It was an adolescent residential um, drug rehab facility called. Compass House, and um, up until then, all residential drug rehab programs had rules that LGBT people were not allowed. I felt that there was residents; it was residential, so how could you have somebody gay in a residential program? So um, you know, Phoenix House, how to say all, all, all the. Uh, it was it was established that if you were known to be gay, you could be in a residential drug rehab program. So it turned out that there were two people on the um, administrative staff at Compass House. One of them is Joe Miller, who I don't know whatever happened to him, and he he disappeared very early on. The other was Sidney Abbott, who. Interestingly, was the partner of Barbara Love, who I mentioned before. Who Sidney Abbott and Barbara Love wrote that very early important work. Sappho was a write-on woman, <clears throat> and so you know Sidney Abbott pushed for this, and the and Compass House agreed that they, as a pilot program, they would start accepting. What they call gay kids, but LGBT youth into the program, and she had connection with Stony Brook, and so Stony Brook assigned me, and I would be the that would be my field placement. I would work with the the gay population at at this adolescent facility. Um, it was groundbreaking. Nobody had done that, and um, I was way over my head. So I, I was. Dealing with street kids and kids from backgrounds that I, which are very unfamiliar to me, and one of my early assignments, um, which I was really hesitant to take, I was running the trans group. There was, there was a weekly trans group, um, and I was it was 1974, so I was 25 years old, <clears throat> 24 going on 20, 23 going on 24. And I had to run the, 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 the trans support group for adolescent street kids who were all, you know, in the sex industry. Um, and at first I wasn't, didn't want to do it, but I realized that if I didn't do it, the person who did it would have been just totally inappropriate, so I agreed to do it. And I learned on the job. It was wonderful. I, I, it was... Um, it, it took a while to, to figure out what I was doing and, and um, figure out how to get these kids from just stop snapping and throwing shade and actually talk about what they were feeling. But, um, what do you think you, made you good at that? I, I think I'm a good listener. Um, I, think, I think it's one of the reasons that I'm not only like to go to meetings and sit on committees, but people always invite me to their committees and 
always try to make me chair of committees, which I don't like to be because it's a very different thing. It's, it's the real PETA principle of being elevated above your level. Um, I love meetings because I'm really good at listening to both sides. Um, and I'm really good at what I call active listening. It's what makes me a good therapy therapist, which is, I think a lot of people when they listen, they're listening for the, the moment when they can interrupt to talk about my experience. Oh, really? That's very interesting. I have a serial answer and then I can talk about me. An active listener says, oh, really? That's very interesting. But how did that make you feel? Or, but isn't that inconsistent with what you just said a few minutes ago? An active listener really helps the, the speaker um, listen to themselves. So I think that's what made me good at it. So my second year field placement was amazing and the school set this up for me. Um, it was a gift and it really became, um, you know, a, a big part of the early work that I was doing with, uh, with adolescents. Um, so was there a point when you decided that, that your work would focus on young people or did did that evolve in a way that like how intentional I, 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 was that? I would that? say three things three things happened um, none of which had to do with my <clears throat> decision making that pushed me into working with adolescents one was this experience that I just described um, being given this amazing field placement working in an adolescent um, residential um, drug rehab facility working with an adolescent population. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and it, it's hard to figure out which came first, but another thing that happened, I, 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 as you know, I'm a founding member of the National Gay Task Force, the National Lesbian Gay Task Force now. And in the very early days, um, and I guess it's because I'm a social worker, um, they established a project to 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 look into and, and to really react to the way that gay kids were treated in the foster care system. And so I was asked to be part of this project. There was <clears throat> there was uh, another person who was on the staff. I, I, I wasn't on the staff. I was on the founding board, and I was of. I've had very few paying jobs in my life. The one at Hedrick Martin is probably the only one I've ever had. <clears throat> um, but there was someone on the staff at the National Lesbian and Gay Task Force who was also a minister, and I wish I remember his name. I think it was Neil. Neil Heron, maybe, but I'm not sure. Um. But he was told to talk to me and and we set up this this project to um, to to really protest some of the practices that the city and the state had one of them and this is very reminiscent of what I said about employment agencies but in What's, what's now called, um, um, what is it, Children's Services, a ACS, ACS Association yeah. for Children's Services. Back then it was called um, Special Services for Children, SSC. They changed the name, didn't change much else about it. But so, and, and SSC ran all of the foster care services, um, including the group homes, which at that time, the, the, the state was still transferring over from an old system of having these large warehouse orphanages to these smaller group homes because of new legislation. But, um, but they were still in the process of transferring over. They still had at least one huge orphanage in, in Manhattan. It was called um, Children's Village. It was like a prison. It was huge. It was almost a city block. And um, 
But anyway, at SSC, they had something, it was a form called Schedule A. I don't know why it was called Schedule A, but that was a bit part of our conversation. Schedule A um, was part of every child's file and, and with every organization. And in the evaluation, and there were two boxes that you could, that a social worker um, could check on the children's forms. And one said homosexual, and one box was latent homosexual, which meant that, you know, the kid didn't even come out or might not be gay or didn't say anything. But in the evaluation of the social worker, the kid is too effeminate or the girl is too much of a tomboy. And they checked this box that says latent homosexual. And if that box is checked on Schedule A, then no group home will take you. And, no, and, and the only places that would take someone with with that designation were the group homes that would also take people with developmental disabilities. So kids who were, kids who were, you know, recognized as or considered to be gay were being housed with people with developmental disabilities, retarded and Down syndrome. Uh, we thought that was wrong. And uh, we met with I still remember the name of the Commissioner of Special Services for Children at that time was Carol Parry. I remember a lot of the names because I used to think that being a commissioner was like, it was like being a movie star. It was like, and that was so important. I didn't realize that it's, it's, it's a bureaucracy, you know, it's, it's just, you know, people just work for the system and eventually somebody, you know, was, uses political favors and gets advanced. So I, I thought that Carol Parry was a very important person. And so we had a meeting with um, her and her staff and convinced them that this was wrong. And um, we also convinced them to set up a um, training, sensitivity training, although they only agreed to do it for their supervi up, 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 up to a supervisory level. So um, staff who in supervisory positions had to go through a four session training program that we helped establish for talking about LGBT issues. And, um, and one of the things that I remember, we, we, a meeting was set up for us to go visit this children's village, which was, like I said, the last remaining really big orphanage, which was like almost a city block and like a prison. And kids never left there. Um, they, they, they lived there, they ate there. Their school was on the premises, their recreation was on the they, so they, they never went out. So I, they, there was a, a rooftop playground, I guess, that they used, but all of the services were in this. So what I remember, the woman who ran it, the, the, the top administrator there, <clears throat> was very, very annoyed to be told that she had to meet with us. Very homophobic woman. And um, very, very defensive. And, you know, insisted that um, th this is quite ridiculous and that we've never had a gay child in this facility. You know, it's, you know, it's just, and, and she was only meeting with us because, you know, her supervisors at, you know, at the state level said that she had to do this. And she gave us this tour of this building. You know, we went, we saw the classrooms, we saw, um, the dining room, we saw a couple of dormitories, um, and then we went to the recreation area, we saw what I guess what you'd call the gym teacher, it was a woman, and, um, and when we told her what we were doing there, this woman just blurted out, she says, thank God somebody is finally doing something for these poor children! And the woman, the administrator, just totally got rigid, like, you know, because this woman was just totally telling the opposite, that she was aware that there were lots of gay kids and, and, and they were not being treated well at all. And so that was, like, a great moment. I may have us take a break for a second. Sure. I had already, I was, I had already left Patrick Martin. I was gone for a year. And the new, the new, Executive Director at Hedrick Martin, um, Francis Kuhnreuter, who 
she and I didn't get along in it. That's a whole other story. When she, and it's it's not a happy story, but when she came in, it was one of those stories where the new boss comes in and decides the first thing she has to do is get rid of all the old guard. She got rid of Joyce Hunter. She got rid of, but, but basically forcing them out. Now, she, couldn't, she couldn't fire them, but making life so unpleasant. She got rid of Joyce Hunter. She got rid of Andy Hammond. I stayed for a whole year, thinking I must be doing something wrong, and, and everybody kept saying she's trying to get rid of you, and I kept saying. No, that doesn't. I, I didn't. I didn't believe it until it was all over. That yeah, this. You know, the reason this my last year at Hetrick Martin was such a sucky year was because she was trying to get me to leave. And the proof of that was that when I finally, finally, first of all, she assigned, she hired a supervisor over me, which I didn't need a supervisor, but I so I had a supervisor over me whose name was um, anyway Val Canuva, but. Um, and she just was critical of everything I did, just put obstacles of everything. But the day that I finally, and she was always saying, well, maybe you're not happy here, maybe you should, maybe it's, you know, you don't. But the day that I finally decided that I would, and I, and I said, well, the one time when she finally said, maybe you should, you know, think of moving on, maybe it's not, and I said, you know, I, I, I might think of that, but I, you know, if I, if I, if I quit, I can't get, um, <laughs> Uh, what do you call it? You know, unemployment. unemployment, and she almost interrupted me and saying, "That's not a problem. We could arrange that." So I finally, and but I decided because I had like three jobs there at that time, I decided I would give six weeks' notice because um, three people had to be hired to replace me, which which is what happened. The morning, the morning after I gave my six weeks' notice, she gave two weeks' notice. Because her only, and other people have been telling me her only job was to get me to leave. So, um, a very unhappy. Person. But I wanted to tell you a story. I said, I was, now actually, let me go back. Because I, I told you before that there were three things that happened that pushed me into working with adolescents. And I gave you two of them so far. One was this incredible opportunity I had doing a social work student field placement in an adolescent facility um, working with its first um, LGBT population. Um, there was this assignment that I was given by the National Gay Task Force, National Lesbian and Gay Task Force, um, addressing problems in, this, in the um, city and state foster care system. The third one, much smaller, but um, a new organization um, was formed called the Association of Lesbian and Gay Social Workers. It started up in 1975. I didn't start it, but I got invited to the very first meeting. I wish I could remember the name of the person who started it. But I was elected vice president. He was president, and I wish I remember his name. Um, and so at our first or second meeting, we established what are the areas that we want to work in, and and um, Caitlin Ryan wanted to work with seniors and eventually became one of the people that set up SAGE. And um, some people wanted to work with in the association, the National Association of Social Workers to um, um, make them more friendly and accommodating to um, the LGBT population and, and to make them address issues and so to and and eventually the whole our whole group the, the Association of Lesbian and Gay Social Workers just became the Lesbian and Gay Issues Committee at the National. So everybody sort of took a and and what was left over was you know youth and I so I it was kind of um, like being picked last on the team. Um, I ended up becoming the head of the youth committee by default because everybody had something that they really wanted to do. So those three things sort of cemented the fact that, you know, that, yeah, that's, that's your specialty, that's what you do, that's, that's, that's your area of expertise, working with youth. So those are, those are the three things that all kind of just happened to me, um, or meant to be, and, um, and just not complaining, it was, it was the right thing. But would I have done that on my own? I'm not sure. So, so I told you that I was going to tell you another story because I I told you about Mel Rosen. So, 
So my first, the first time I met Mel Rosen was when he got referred to me at the firehouse and I got told that, you know, you're chair of goods and services, so he has this idea, you're going to, we did, it was, it was great, a three-year run of uh, running um, an employment pro program, it was fabulous. Um, Mel made fun, when I started to become religious, <coughs> Mel made a lot of fun of me, um, thought, you know, just... As, as other people did too, thought it was kind of silly. But eventually, he got involved in the gay synagogue and eventually became the president for several years, for a number of years, Mel Rosen was the president of the gay synagogue, CBST. Um, but he also, he um, became very politically involved. And, 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 and he reminded me of, in many ways of Ethan Ghetto, who was sort of a very, Big booming voice and, and and not shy at all. Like you know, he was someone who got things done and always, whatever he did, he took a leadership position. So I got a call from him in I think it was eighty four or eighty five, not sure, and he was now working for Governor Carey, and he was basically the AIDS coordinator and so he invited me to a meeting and the purpose of this meeting was that the the administration under Carrie un, uh, uh, and understood that in order to in order to get education, you know, AIDS awareness and, and safe sex practices awareness out there, they needed to team with the LGBT community. That um, they didn't have the expertise or the connections. So they were looking, so they are putting out RFPs, um, requests for proposals to gay organizations um, <coughs> who were doing work that fit into that um, concept. Now something I have to say first, up until that time, and, and I can tell you lots of stories about this, we haven't talked about this, every single gay organization up until that time operated on a volunteer basis. Almost nobody had paid staff. Almost nobody had paid, and if they did, it was one or two um, executive directors who were woefully underpaid. Um, fundraising in the in the LGBT community back then was at a meeting you pass the hat and everybody put in a dollar or two or five dollars or you know which is a big thing um, but there were no fundraising campaigns I I'll, I'll tell you some really good stories which actually I, which I uh, I have to tell about early attempts at fundraising that were disastrous um, but there was no adult, real, legitimate fundraising going on in the gay community. Um, and part of that, there was a very good reason for that. This hinges on some of the stories I want to tell. Gay people didn't write checks to gay organizations because it was a paper trail. Without them, people were still closeted. People were not. So people would take change out of the pocket, but they weren't going to give you a check. Um, it, was, it was dangerous. Um, so you couldn't have an organization where people were going to make major contributions. So Mel Rosen set up this meeting and invited um, representatives and heads of at least 20 different organizations around the city. Most of them, many of them were churches, you know, um, different gay churches and gay organization, Dignity and Church of the Boba Disciple and um, MCC Church. But there was Hedrick Martin, I don't remember, but there were all of these organizations invited. And and he announced that the governor was putting out this RFP, you know, RFP for request for proposals, um, that money was available um, for people who were doing work that educated the community about AIDS and HIV. Only maybe two or three of us in the room had ever heard of an RFP or ever worked on a proposal. These are heads of organizations. 
And everybody just stunned and said, what money? Like, what do we have to do to get this money? And that would just say, you just have to write an RFP. Well, what do we have to do to get it? And it says, well, what are you doing now? It says, well, we do that. And he says, does that help um, educate people about HIV? And I said, yes, well, that's what you're doing. And they say, well, what can we spend this money on? He says, what are your expenses? You know, I said, you know, can we buy office furniture? Yes, we can buy office furniture. You, can, you know, you can pay rent. You know. And they just, and people were disbelieved because people had, you know, spent years saying that, you know, this is not how you, you raise money by passing the hat around the room or, or basket and people would, and it just went back and forth. People said, well, well, how do we get this order? What and they just kept asking the same question over and over, and he was like shouting at people, this money is available, and we want to give you this money to just, you know, all you have to do is, if you have clients who come to you um, and get any services, you need to, and you can talk to them about HIV, or even have pamphlets in which they can learn it, you can get, and, and I frequently refer to that day as the day that changed everything. That was the day and the meeting when the LGBT community finally grew up and came into the adult world of fundraising um, when these things were possible. Prior to that, they had never been possible. I want to tell you another story that was much earlier, to, which, which I touched on about people not giving money. So back in the days of GAA, um, it might have been in, I'm trying to remember who was Jay. It might have been the National Gay Task Force, and and I, I, and I do need to tell the story of how the National Gay Task Force formed, because it was the same people. Um, but a, a a book had just come out, one of the again very early, very important books called um, Society and the Healthy Homosexual by Dr. George Weintraub. That was the book that coined the phrase homophobia in that book. And and it actually, and this was a gay book that actually made it, you know, got reviewed in the New York Times, and I don't remember if it was a bestseller or not, but it, but, it, but it was an important book. People knew this book. And so the executive staff, as I said, I, I think it was actually the National Task Force, but it was Bruce Fowler and it was, it was the heads of the organization decided this would be a great theme for a fundraising party and we had a um, we had a cocktail party in the home of the author Dr. George Weintraub and everybody was advised and instructed to invite all the richest people that they knew, everybody with money, um, for book signing at Dr. Weintraub and there was a great turnout and I invited some people too and I, I, I I knew all these older men that I had dated that with lots of money who's, who, were, who were great sugar daddies and um, had lots of money. We invited everybody. Um, and it was a great turnout, great party, great speeches made. And then we made the big ask and nobody write a check. And everybody reached into the pocket and put like five or ten dollars and but like, nobody would write a check. And everybody, and, and when we had people say, I can't have the name of the National Gay Task Force on, on, in my checkbook. So that was, that was fundraising in the old days. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that are mm -hmm. really kind of changing the topic just because I'm aware of time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about because I heard you talk about it and I know it was important mm -hmm. um, a, a little bit in the later period mm -hmm. Um, is when you were out protesting cruising and, oh, and yeah. beaten by the police. And now, I know it's already been 10 years almost that you're on an advisory board right. for the police. So I was hoping that you could sort of tell <coughs> the story of why were you protesting and why was that important and then what happened? Well, I can go back even earlier. So I'll, I'll tell you so that nobody knows. And I didn't find out until after that whole incident. Um, why did those protests start up in the first place? Where did that whole um, angst and, and uh, motivation for protesting the film Cruising originate? Now the film did deserve to be protested. It, it's just a, you know, a really homophobic um, 
screenplay and um, a crazy film. Um, but how did the whole community, uh, you, you know, during the filming of the movie, usually, usually people don't know about a film until it opens, but how did this all come about? And I'll tell you, and only hardly anybody knows this now, more people will know. Arthur Bell, do you know who Arthur Bell was? No. Okay, Arthur Bell was an early activist at the Firehouse too, but he also had a, he had a column in the Village Voice called Bell Tells. And he was a very important um, columnist, especially covering nightlife, but also some um, community political stuff. Um, but Arthur Bell was, um, you know, a, an important person in the community because he had, he had this very widely read column in the Village Voice. Arthur had also written a book a couple of years before called, the book was called Kings Don't Mean a Thing. And it was a story um, based on a true story of a gay serial killer. Um, who killed some um, society person? And I, don't, I never actually read it, but um, but so he had the, he had this he he wrote this book um, about a gay serial killer, and he was trying to sell it to Hollywood to make a film. And everybody was telling him, "Oh, we can't do that because we're already doing a gay serial killer film called Cruising." And um, and so, so for a very personal motivation, because his book was being turned down because this other book was being turned into a movie, Arthur used his column to turn everybody against this movie. Arthur was a friend of mine, so I know this story. Um, as I said, I don't think I don't think there are five people in alive today who could tell you what I'm telling you. But uh, Arthur used this column to turn everybody against the film. And, and, and once he did, then um, the organizations, you know, that were around in the community, got very behind this idea. And we had these protests to, to actually try to shut down the filming, to try to get the city to renew, revoke their permits, to have demonstrations making loud noise so that they couldn't film on the street. Um, and I was at one of these protests, and yeah, something got out of hand, and I got beaten up by the police, and um, spent two weeks in the hospital. I was, I was, it was, it was really bad. Um, fortunately, it was caught on video, the beating. It's on YouTube now. Um, the New York Civil Liberties Union wanted to represent me. And I won my police brutality case against the city. And I've been told, and I, I think it's true, that it was, um, it's the first time that a police brutality case was won on the basis of a videotape. Because things didn't get taped. I mean, everything gets recorded now. You know, nothing used to get recorded. You know, people didn't, well, let's talk about this, but we didn't take pictures. You know, we took pictures at graduations and weddings and um, bar mitzvahs, um, not at lunch. Um, so fortunately, somebody in the crowd was filming for, for another reason and caught a good part, not the entire, but a good part of the, and therefore, in spite of the fact that um, the police were giving a very different version than mine, the videotape proved that my version was right. And, because it was the first time that such a case was won on the basis of videotape evidence. So I won my suit. Back then, um, uh, you know, court cases weren't million dollar cases. I got $75,000, um, which eventually became the down payment for this house. So um, things happen for a good reason. So and now you it was a terrible saying, thing, but. Yeah. Uh, my life would be very different if that didn't happen. It, it, um, it also gave me the ability to take a year off to go to Israel to study um, for, for a whole year. So, um, 
So it was, um, even though it was a terrible thing that happened, it was frightening and I thought I was going to die and I spent two weeks in the hospital and time recovering. Um, I have to say that it, it was, um, in the long run, it was, it was a good thing that that happened. So I want to ask you, um, <clears throat> as we kind of wrap up, since you mentioned that then you went to Israel and, and that was mm -hmm. obviously very important for mm -hmm. the rest of your life's path. Um, maybe the way to ask you about that is, we talked about this before we started recording, that you have two names, Steve and Shlomo. Um, do you maybe want to kind of... I, I think, yeah, um, I was going to tell a different story than that, but, um, but let me talk about Steve and Shlomo, because I know it confuses people, and sometimes it's confusing to me. Um, so Shlomo's not a made-up name. I've spent most of my life as Steve, um, certainly growing up, and I've and known, been known professionally and known in the community as Steve. But Shlomo is the Jewish name that I was given when I was born. It's the person that I was named after, um, was really named Shlomo, and his English name was Stanley. But um, I was called Steve, but the person I was named after was Shlomo. But it's not a name that I use a lot, although when I went to Hebrew school for the three years um, in preparation for my bar mitzvah, boom, I was Shlomo there. And um, when I became religious, I became Shlomo at the Gay Synagogue and the year that I spent in Israel. And as I developed a, a, you know, a growing circle of, of Jewish friends in, in the Orthodox community, I was Shlomo there. And, and in more recent years when I've become actively involved in organizations like Eshel and Wider Bridge that are specifically geared to um, the Jewish community, I'm Shlomo. And for years it wasn't a problem. It wasn't a problem that I was Steve someplace and Shlomo other places because the worlds didn't intersect. It was, there was no overlap. Um, so it, it, it didn't matter. But today, partly because of social media and the internet and, and the mainstreaming of, of groups that used to be more private, um, it's confusing to people because I, I, I run into people who know me in both communities and feel like that to go back. And I feel like I need to make a choice. And it's also my Facebook page name, which I didn't choose. My husband cho chose it when he was setting up my account. And it's, it's, it's Steve Shlomo Ashkenazi, which every time I look at it, it, it sort of sticks in my throat. It doesn't quite work. So I think if I had to, to choose, I would be Shlomo all the time. But um, I don't like to impose it on people and say, I don't want to tell people, don't call me that anymore. So, but I, I'm probably more comfortable and like Shlomo more. Why is that? Um, I think that's a good question. Um, maybe because there's fewer. Like there's, there's one board that I sit on where there are already three Steves <laughs> on it, and I'm the only Shlomo. Um, but I think it, it takes, it, it's one of my identities that I'm very proud of. You know, people sometimes ask me, which is more important, your Jewish identity or your gay identity? And it, to me, it's not a reasonable question because they're, you know, I am both, and both are important. And there are moments of the day and different days when one is more important because I'm working on it. But, but um, I, it's like asking a parent who their favorite child is. It's, you know, some days you have to go to the Little League game with one child, and another day you take another child to the doctor, but they're both equally. So I'm, but because Shlomo represents my Jewish identity in a way that Steve doesn't necessarily represent either, I think I prefer Shlomo. So can I tell you one more story, but I have to remember what it is. Um, yes, because I realized when, when I was trying to decide whether one of the stories I told, whatever it happened at the firehouse, and GAA or the National Gay Task Force, um, it reminded me that there's a lot of, you know, that there's a certain overlap that I think is important to know. May, maybe this has been told, maybe other people have told the story before, but, but it's really important to know why the National Lesbian and Gay Task Force, which was a national, why it was formed in the first place. 
Um, and this is the story. The, the president of GAA at that time was Bruce Veller. And my partner, Lutad, and I were partly instrumental in getting Bruce to agree to be the president. Bruce, Bruce was a um, professor at the Rockefeller Institute. And he got involved in GAA. And he was very professional, very smart, very scientific. He was a scientist. Um, and a, a number of us really felt that he would be the best president for GAA. And he was tempted, but he, it would mean giving up his job. And, um, But we spent a, we spent a number of weeks convincing him that he should run he should run for president for the next president, and one of one of the ways we did that is since I had a car, Lou and I and a couple of other people sometimes Morty Manfred we would drive him home all the way uptown after GA meetings in my car while they would I uh, would drive while they would convince him why he should run so he finally decided to be president, and he became and he was elected as president of GA. However, it wasn't a, a great fit because GAA was run as like the most democratic organization you can imagine. Like you couldn't make any decisions without a vote of the entire membership. And Bruce liked to go off and do things on his own. Um, so on several occasions he was censured by the organization from the floor for maybe writing a letter that without approval or making a, an expenditure without the approval of, of the whole organization. And um, so he finally decided he'd had it and he couldn't deal with that and that's not the way to get things done. And so he convinced a number of us <coughs> to set up the National Gay Task Force. And he took a couple of the officers from GAA and, and a few leading members, including myself, and we had a press conference, which was actually in my place. I used to, another big part of my history, you know I, I own some restaurants and all that's another whole story for another day. But so the, the press conference announcing the um, the creation of the National Gay, Gay Task Force took place in my restaurant. I was there, and I was one of the charter members. Um, but the reason was because he couldn't work under the. I was the only person, and and there was no reason not to. But um, of all of all the people who broke away from GAA to start the National Gay Task Force. I was the only person who, who became a member of the National Council but didn't sever my ties with GAA. And I really felt, as I still do, that they both serve legitimate purposes. And that um, whereas the Gay Activist Alliance was, um, was an important militant organization that could um, organize demonstrations and, um, and protests to make our voice heard. The, um, the National Gay Task Force was a great instrument for sitting down with people in power and, um, and negotiating and educating people. And although they, they had the same goals, they had very, very different um, methods. And so I thought that they both needed. And so I stayed active in both orders. I would continue to was still running my um, employment service. I also became was asked that the next president of GAA was Morty Manfred, a name I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. probably yes. Mm -hmm. Start of P flag and all. Mm -hmm. He was a good friend of mine. I made the nominating speech for Morty. So I had, I had, um, I didn't feel I had split allegiances. I felt that they were both important organizations. There were a few people, and, and sometimes I, I, I became criticized by people in one organization for belonging to the other and and some people were suspicious that I was a spy for the other organization was bringing you know sharing information and um, but I 
I felt that they they both served a purpose. But that's that was that's the story behind the forming of the National Great Task Force. And can I tell one more story? Yes, you can. Okay, Gladly. something else I don't know if you know about. One of the things I mentioned one of, one of the incredible and you know things about the Gay Activist Alliance, and and a lot of people wondered how we did that. That um, the ability to organize demonstrations on on very very short notice, um, sometimes because of um, an announcement in city hall or something, or 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 a news article, and suddenly we had you know a hundred demonstrators you know on the street, and people often marveled at like our ability to do that. Do you know how that was done? Have you ever? You know, I've read about it, and now I don't recall. Have you ever heard of the Joe Cohn list? No. Okay, good. So this is, again, you know, long before the era of the internet, even before the era of, of um, home answering machines. I mean, people didn't have answering machines most of it. So, um, and as I said before, most people were very closeted. So I don't know who came up with the idea at GAA, but we had something called the Joe Cone List. Um, if you put you you could choose to be on the Joe Cone List, which meant that you gave that the organization had your phone number, no cell phones, just phone number. Um, but with the understanding that if anybody but you answered the phone, they'd be tell I'll tell them to call Joe Cone, which just seemed like a neutral name that wouldn't around suspicion and um, but you know nobody was going to leave a message that said there's going to be a gay demonstration or something so uh, and, and there were still people who still wouldn't put the name on the joke but the Joe Cohn list of the gay activist lines was a list in which you could put your name and you'd be called if they needed you to show up for something and if you didn't answer you'd just be given the message Joe Cohn called and when you got that message you meant call back and find out what's going on and that, and it was very successful, at getting all of these large demonstrations that amazed, you know, um, the politicians and the media, and the police, that we turn out these big numbers and on short notice. And did you like protesting? Did you like being out in the street? That's a great question. Um, I really, I realized how important it was. I'll tell you, I, I had mentioned before, before that one of my first introductions to G at my first introduction to the Gay Activist Alliance, I went up to the third floor where they played videotapes. I did get to see a videotape of myself at a demonstration, and I didn't like what I saw, and it changed me. Um, um, I saw myself screaming and, and you know at police who were trying to keep us in a certain area and and it changed me. I decided I didn't want to be that person. Um, so I, I, I find demonstration to be really important. I do show up for demonstrations. Um, but I don't I don't like to trigger my anger. I I like to keep decorum. I think that um, I have a belief that more gets accomplished by in, in convincing people by meeting on equal terms. So, um, but I know at demonstrations people do get out of hand and, and, and people do scream and people do break the rules and somebody tried to climb the Statue of Liberty last week. And, um, so, your question was, do I like going to demonstrations? I, it, for me, it's like an obligation. It's something that you, you have to do. It's like saying, do you like to go to weddings? <laughs> it's like, does anybody really like to go to weddings? I don't know. Um, it's, you have to do it, and, you, and, and yeah, and you have a good time when you're there, but, um, but at, at a cost. So we're gonna wrap up soon. So cool. before we do, I mm -hmm. um, wanna ask you, given that the, um, and the 50th anniversary of Stonewall is coming up. It's kind of a moment uh, for the gay community to, to mm -hmm. think about what's happened in, in 50 years. Um, and you've been active in all of those years. Yeah. 
So when you think about your life and the path you've taken and the sort of the path of the gay rights movement, how, how do you put the pieces together? What, what do you? I feel so incredibly on? lucky. I, I started off when you asked me about my early childhood, growing up as an early baby boomer right after the war in 1950s, you know, Brooklyn, New York. Um, great schools, great, you know, everything was sort of, I, I feel incredibly blessed to be born at the time that I was. Like, sometimes when people look at my resume and they say, well, you've done so many firsts, you know, you know, you're the first person to do it, you're the first person, the first openly um, gay social worker in the country, the first, uh, Lou Tan and I were the first openly gay men to get a liquor license in New York State. I have so many firsts. And I tell people, well, it was timing. I said, you know, at the time that I came out, anything you decided to do, probably nobody did it before as an openly gay person. So it was like, it was so easy to be the first. Um, it was it was like leaving footprints in virgin snow. <laughs> it was like, you know, nobody, nobody was there. So, and the great thing about being first is you don't have to be the best. <laughs> you just... Have to you know someone can come right after you and do a much better job, but they can't be the first. So um, I I just feel blessed that you know I've I've had the opportunity to be around you know from the beginning that I was and and, and to still be here. You know, part of that is because I'm still fascinated and interested and want to be involved. I you know I haven't gotten tired. Of, of going to meetings and showing up, and um, so that's part of it. And and the other incredibly fortunate thing, and I, I touched on this before, is that I'm still here. And that you know, I, the statistical probability of my surviving the AIDS crisis is, I mean, I've, I've I've not only have I lost friends, but I've lost lovers. You know, when, when AIDS first came out, I was in a long-term relationship with someone. Um, for seven years, from from seventy seven to eighty five, he died in eighty five. So we were together when AIDS came out, and he um, he was diagnosed in eighty, the very end of eighty three. So even before there was a test for HIV, or they knew what caused it. I I just assumed that I was going to be infected by AIDS. So I can't tell you why. Um, but yeah, I lost lots of friends and, and partners, and I'm still here, so I, if I'm here, I, I feel like I'm here for a reason, and um, maybe my reason is to keep um, doing my community service. Is there anything else you want to say before we say goodbye? Uh, I think for now, I, I hope we'll get together again. I think there's, there's more stories and more to tell, but... Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground today, okay. and I've enjoyed it. Good. Thank you. Good. Mm -hmm. So we'll say goodbye. Good. Thank you so much. <laughs>